On the evening of October 12, 2016, Alice Ruggles returned home from work. She could be seen entering her apartment by the rear view camera of a parked car. Several hours later, her roommate discovered her badly bludgeoned body in the bathroom of her apartment. Keep watching to find out what happened to Alice Ruggles and how the incompetence of the police resulted in the death of a talented young woman. Alice was born on December 24, 1991 to Sue Hills and Clyde Ruggles. She was the third of the four Ruggles children and had two older siblings, Nick and Emma Ruggles, and a younger brother, Patrick. The family of six was close-knit. Even as the children grew older and moved away from home, they stayed in touch through the family group chat on WhatsApp. Her friends and family described her as kind, hardworking, and helping. She could charm anyone with her sense of humor. Alice easily made friends wherever she went. She had a way of making people feel at ease by smiling and joking with them. She attended the Lester High School for Girls, immersing herself in the drama department. She performed in several plays. After graduating from high school, she attended Northumbria University, located 200 miles north of Leicestershire, to study product design. She graduated from university in 2014 with a degree in product design engineering and quickly found work at the UK broadcasting company Sky in Newcastle, England. Alice moved into an apartment in Gateshead, a big town on the other side of the Tyne River. In October 2015, Alice met a guy by the name of Truman Dillon, also known as Harry. Harry was a lance corporal based in Glencore's barracks in Edinburgh. At the time he and Alice met, he was serving in Afghanistan in a non-combat role. Alice was introduced to him online by a mutual acquaintance while he was serving in Afghanistan. They met in person in January 2016 and soon started dating. Initially, the relationship was going well. Harry was caring, attentive, and considerate. Alice and Harry spent a blissful week together in Newcastle and another in Edinburgh before he went to Afghanistan for his final two-month tour of duty. However, everything changed when Harry came back to the UK in April 2016. Alice's friends, family, and co-workers started noticing changes in Alice's behavior. She wasn't the upbeat, effervescent person she usually was. Normally, she was enthusiastic and involved in the conversation, but she was becoming increasingly distant and withdrawn. It appeared as though she was always mentally somewhere else. She even lost a lot of weight in a short amount of time. Alice's friends and family realized that her new boyfriend, Harry Dillon, was the cause of her personality and behavioral changes. Harry, it turned out, was not the polite and caring man Alice had met online. He was actually possessive and dominating. He wanted total control over Alice's life. He had become critical of her appearance and of her friends and family, so she steadily became isolated. After a fight with her new housemates, she moved out and into a ground floor apartment on Rawling Road in Gateshead with her co-worker Maxine. Around this time, Alice was approached by another woman whom Harry had met on a dating website, informing Alice that she and Harry were talking. Alice ended the relationship with Harry because she could no longer trust him. In fact, while Harry demanded her unwavering loyalty, he was cheating on her, contacting other women and engaging in casual sex with them. Alice may have ended the relationship, but getting Harry out of her life proved impossible. The more Alice tried to push Harry away, the more he hounded and harassed her. Harry bombarded her with calls, texts, and emails in the weeks following the breakup and Alice's mental and physical health started to deteriorate. He would beg her to take him back, telling her how much he loved her and promising to change. At times, he was manipulative, attempting to guilt her into getting back together with him, sobbing that he would kill himself and that it would be her fault. Then, there came the threatening messages, in which he threatened to post compromising images of her online and she did not get back together with him. Alice initially tried to be pleasant and let him down easy, but when she realized that this was not going to work, she began ignoring him. Harry became enraged and began calling Alice's family and friends. He even tried to call Sue, Alice's mother, referring to her as mom. He begged her to try to reason with Alice. Sue told Harry to leave Alice alone since he was nothing but bad news. Harry was able to hack into Alice's social media accounts and read her private messages, 
allowing him to know where she was going and who she was communicating with. Early in September, he learned from Alice's Facebook that she had started dating someone else, an army officer named Mike. Harry set out to destroy her new relationship by contacting Mike directly. He sent Mike texts telling him how bad Alice was, that she was still telling Harry that she loved him and that she was cheating on Mike with him. On September 30th, Harry drove to Alice's apartment. He repeatedly rang the doorbell and hid when she peeked through the peephole. Alice knew in her gut that it was Harry, so she didn't open the door. She scaled the fence into the back garden and banged on Alice's ground floor window while she was sleeping. Alice, terrified, peered around the curtain and saw a package of chocolates and a bouquet of flowers on her windowsill. She caught a glimpse of Harry backing away from the window. As he drove back to Edinburgh, he left one last voicemail. He kept repeating that he didn't want to kill her and wouldn't kill her. At this point, Alice had had enough, and at last she contacted the police. Harry had crossed the line when he drove all that way, left unwanted gifts, and terrified her by knocking on her window and waking her up. She dialed the UK's non-emergency number, 101. Alice was shaken by the phone call, but she tried to remain calm and polite. The operator informed Alice that she could hire a lawyer and obtain a restraining order, or Harry could be served with a police information notice, also known as a PIN. A PIN is a warning letter to the offender that they are on police radar for allegations of stalking or harassment. Alice chose the PIN option. The police logged the incident as harassment and issued a PIN, and Alice had regained her old self-confidence, believing she was safe. She had no idea that PIN notices do not constitute formal legal action. They would only inform Harry that Alice had contacted the police. The way it was described to Alice on the phone was deceptive and gave her a false sense of security. Meanwhile, Harry's army superiors delivered the police warning to him in his barracks on October 3rd. Colleagues, friends, and even a pediatrician advised him not to contact Alice, but Harry was not deterred. Neither Police Scotland nor the Royal Military Police were aware that Harry Dillon had received a pin notice. The police lack of involvement in actually communicating with Harry is shocking. Unsurprisingly, Harry ignored the warning letter and got to work putting together a package to send to Alice. He included notebooks, photos, and a letter in the package. The letter was hostile in tone, and he complained about Alice reporting him to the police. He attempted to make her feel guilty by writing that his phone, laptop, and iPad had been confiscated all of which was untrue. He finished the letter by writing, I'm in a lot of shit now, but I hope you feel happy. I'm sending you everything I have that reminds me of you as you belong to another man, wishing you to a happy life. I will never come in your life again. The police had instructed Alice to call them if Harry contacted her again. So she did that on October 7th when she received the package. However, rather than focusing on the fact that Harry had violated the pin notice by contacting Alice, the operator was more concerned with the contents of the package. Alice informed the operator that, while Harry stated in his letter that he would not contact her again, he had said the same thing multiple times in the past. He always got back to her, no matter what. He couldn't bear the thought of leaving her alone. The operator informed Alice that someone would call her back to discuss what to do next. She was understandably irritated by this response. She had called the cops on Harry once before and then again when he ignored the pin notice. They didn't realize how terrified she was, nor did they realize what Harry was capable of, despite her telling them how extreme the stalking had become. Harry drove down to Alice's house after dark on October 10th, climbed into the back garden, and photographed the rear window before driving back to Edinburgh. Harry drove down from Edinburgh again on October 12th and parked near Alice's apartment waiting for her to return home. While waiting, he messaged another woman, attempting to set up a meeting later that evening in Scotland. Harry climbed into Alice's apartment around 6 p.m., this time forcing his way in through a window. He grabbed a sharp kitchen knife and cornered Alice in the bathroom. Her roommate, Maxine, returned shortly afterwards and found her lying on the floor, blood everywhere. Understandably terrified, Maxine dialed 999, she informed the operator that she discovered her roommate covered in blood on the floor. In the call, she named Harry Dillon as the murderer, calling him an absolute psychopath. When the cops and paramedics arrived at the apartment, 
Maxine's worst fears were realized. Alice Ruggles was declared dead at the scene. Alice died of catastrophic blood loss as a result of her carotid artery being severed, according to the forensic reports. Her throat had been slit at least six times and she had suffered 23 injuries in total. Harry Dillon was apprehended just hours later at his Edinburgh barracks. He initially told the officers who arrested him that he had no knowledge of Alice's death, but the evidence against him was overwhelming. Harry's trial began in April 2017. At this point, he was still pleading not guilty. Harry testified for two days during his trial. During his testimony, he claimed Alice attacked him with the knife and they struggled. He asserted that Alice stabbed herself in the neck while he was attempting to pry the knife away from her. Harry's story was ridiculous and the jury saw right through it. And finally, after just two hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty of Alice Ruggles' murder and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 22 years. Alice Ruggles' family started a trust in her name after the murder. The trust has done everything it can to raise public awareness of the dangers of stalking, particularly among young people. All in all, the murder of Alice Ruggles is a chilling reminder of just how dangerous stalkers can get if they're ignored.